Mm. Is this how you become the next Cambridge Analytica? No, Karen. Sit down. What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you came here looking for an instruction video on how to become the next data scandal, you're in the wrong place because we're not about that life. Instead, what we're going to be talking about today is how to use data and influence people because people aren't inherently drawn to numbers and rational decisions as much as we'd like to think so. So one of the best skills that you can learn for your career is actually to influence people's decisions and data is such a good way to do so. One of the questions that I ask myself almost every day in my work is how do I construct a compelling narrative around my work and around the projects that I work on in order to influence other people's decisions and thinking. So in this video I'm going to talk through what I've learned in the past four years about using data to land your point and sell your ideas. So if that's something you would like to learn about, smash the like button because you've come to the right place and we'd like for others to find here too. Before we get into any of the juicy stuff, I wanted to say that I'm approaching this topic from a data analyst perspective where I have done all the data work myself. But this by no means means that you in any role that you're in couldn't use these tips. Actually quite the contrary. These principles will be useful to any role where you need to sell your ideas, convince other people, or just quantify your results. Will this mean that you need to know and understand what the data that you use actually means? Yes. Does that mean that before you clicked on this video and smashed the like button, you didn't need to know that? No. And if you didn't, and you've been using data that you didn't know what it means and where it actually comes from, Girl, you need to be the one that watches until the freaking end cards on this video, because we're not about that life. We know what we're talking about. We know the data that we use, okay? Otherwise... Shame. 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 Just kidding. Sort of. So what are we talking about when I say using data to influence people? Nothing super sinister, quite the opposite actually. What I mean is strengthening your argument by providing relevant data points in an understandable and easily digested format. If you mean to establish your voice as an authority on any given topic, you need to be able to quantify it, relate it to other topics, and above all, build compelling narratives around it. And that is exactly why this topic is so important. I'll also be touching on some of the ethical aspects of how to do this, in case there are any manipulative weirdos in the back. I see you. And there will also be a bonus tip at the very end of this video, so if you watch all the way through you'll be able to get it, but only then, so keep watching. So without further ado, let's go. The first thing that I really want to talk about is why should your audience care and because you care is not the answer. I know you hear the advice of tailor your presentation to your audience pretty much in any turn of events, and I'm sure you think you do that. but. Do you really? I rarely see people put as much effort in tailoring their data as much as they put into picking the color scheme of their slides. And as much as I love a good slide deck, and I really do, my manager calls me a slide freak, you can't, unfortunately, color your way out of a poorly prepared presentation. So in order to get your audience's attention, what should you do? Before putting together your presentation, make sure you understand your audience's priorities. For example, can you find their next 6 to 12 months roadmap? Knowing exactly what your audience is trying to achieve is your golden ticket to grabbing that sweet, sweet attention because, I mean, we'd like to think otherwise, but we're not very altruistic creatures, especially at work. Other things to pay attention to is would implementing your idea or a solution, for example, help a common stakeholder, user group, or maybe a client. The further you can establish that you're almost doing them a favor by presenting your idea to them, the better. Not in an obnoxious way, obviously, but look, you need to be able to showcase that your and their goals align and that this is benefiting them as well, because otherwise, why would they actually give a flying you know what. Outcome from this point of aligning yourself with your audience's goals would be something like common metrics that you're obviously going to be presenting and any projections on how you could actually improve those metrics by implementing your idea. Unfortunately, metrics aren't enough though. You need to be able to establish meaning that is beyond the numbers. Because 
we as creatures like to think we're better with statistics and numbers than we actually are and science has proven so. And we like science on this channel. To be truly influential, we need to make things simpler than complex statistics, especially in a business setting where you can just about maybe get people to read the TLDR of your story. And to do that, we need to build context. And I want to talk about three of some of the strongest tools that you can use to make your data points more meaningful to your audience. And those are visuals, comparisons, and tangible metrics. And and any combinations of the three. And I'm gonna start with visuals. I think we've all sometimes seen um, bad and great visuals, and you can probably tell the difference. What good visuals are doing is they're helping you make connections between the data points that you're seeing without making too much of an effort. They're intuitively directing your eye to patterns and trends that you couldn't see in the raw data. Visualizations can also be a lot more compelling than just raw data because they can incorporate more data and information to build a bigger picture and they can also be interactive such as some geographical charts for example. And to make things more interesting, together with comparisons, visuals can actually give you a better sense of scale. A brilliant example of this is the interactive visualization of Jeff Bezos' fortune compared to many other smaller data points to try and capture the scale of what $100 billion actually looks like. The whole thing went viral and for a good reason. It's an absolutely amazing example and not even necessarily the most complex example of how to build a narrative around your data points and make it compelling and interesting and interactive for your audience. Finally, I want to talk about tangible metrics. And what I mean by tangible metrics is taking the closest tangible real life thing that you have to your data and explaining your data set in those terms. So let's say, for example, that you're explaining how many hours you're saving by implementing your idea. Don't just talk about the hours because time is a very intangible concept. And as much as we can be like, look, we're saving 100,000 hours a year, that doesn't really compute. Instead, put it in monetary terms. This is how many dollars are going to be saved because of this particular idea. Or this is how many people's work during that year is going to be saved because of this idea, because that's more concrete. That's something that people can visualize or they can conceptualize in their minds rather than having a lump sum of hours that most people can translate to days or weeks or months in their heads. The best combinations of these three things, visuals, comparisons, and tangible metrics are obviously dependent on what the context is for your data. But finding a ways to use these to bring your points to life is a really powerful tool that you can use to influence people with data. And because I can't get enough about talking about building narratives and storytelling around your data, let's talk about building scenarios. In the last point, I talked about building a story around the data that you have, which aligns more with descriptive statistics or descriptive analysis, so describing something that's in the past. With building scenarios, I talk more about prescriptive and predictive statistics or analysis, and that's looking into the future and looking at the data and trying to extrapolate what might happen in different scenarios if you actually implement your idea. If you want to know more about different types of analysis or the basics of data analytics, I have a video about that that I made, data analytics for beginners, that I'm going to link up so that you can also go and watch that if you'd like to dive a little bit deeper into the topic. But to stick to the topic of building scenarios. The power of this really lies in the difference of presenting an idea or a problem, which is, I mean, it's great. You're presenting something that people can think about, but the difference with building scenarios and taking that a little bit further is actually giving people options for action and shifting their thinking from just looking at the problem to already trying to solve it and thinking about which solution would be the best rather than just pondering about the issue at hand you're putting your minds into the solution mode, which is already propelling their brains forward to thinking about actually solving it rather than thinking about whether it should be solved. See how that is a lot better? When presenting scenarios though, don't forget to include dependencies and risks, just as you would with any kind of analysis to make sure that you're presenting the whole picture because the point isn't to create these glorified scenarios. The point is to give them paths to implementing your idea helping them understand what it would take to go the distance and what the destination would look like. And to give you a little bit more to think about before you're presenting your idea is a concept that we all know. Some of us deny it, but it matters, which is size. And <laughs> 
this point is asking yourself the question of is this an isolated issue or is this problem actually something that is prevalent in other parts of the organization? Is this something that impacts more people than I initially thought in my scoping? And can I actually build a more scalable solution that would solve a bigger problem than what I'm initially talking about? And it's no shame going back to your drawing board. If you end up realizing that you're actually solving for something bigger, it will actually make your argument that much more compelling because you can showcase that you've gone from this first initial idea to this entire bigger solution and how you got there. But going through that thought process is you making sure that you are solving the problem and not just patching over a symptom. It's helping you to sell the idea by, again, building a narrative around how you actually got to the solution that you are presenting right now and showcasing the use of data in your analysis because you went ahead and actually looked at the data across the board in a bigger scale. And to make sure that you are focusing on expressing your idea and your analysis in a way that makes sense to your audience, let's keep in mind the principle, keep it simple, stupid, because this is not the time that you're flexing to your data analyst or data scientist colleagues about how great your methodology was, because if you end up presenting your idea in a way that your audience doesn't understand or comprehend or buy, you are the idiot in the room. How do we avoid this? Have clear explanations for all the numbers and metrics that you use in your presentation. And we hopefully never went to a presentation without supporting slides, but if we did in the past, we're going to fix that now. Don't present anything that you don't need to in order for your audience to understand your point. Have the necessary metrics, the necessary KPIs and numbers there, but if you feel like there might be questions about some aspects of your analysis, have supporting slides. Have slides at the end of your presentation that are not shown unless there are questions at the end about that particular point, but after you can refer to them if needed. Like in most cases, 20% of the information does 80% of the work. And because we want to use data responsibly and in a constructive manner to make our point, let's talk about a couple of points that I think are really, really important whenever you're using data to support your arguments or make a case to other people. The first of them is transparency. And by transparency, I mean making sure that you are candid about any data collection or processing methodologies, as well as your data's limitations and any dependencies it might have. And I think it's important that you're able to explain all of the above in a way that would make sense to an average Joe. This doesn't have to take a ton of time in your presentation, but if there are any caveats to your data, you better be upfront about it. Because it's kind of like in a relationship, if you're omitting information, it's not like you're outright lying about it, but if they find out and you didn't tell, it's not doing any good for the trust. It's really easy to lose trust and fail to convince your audience if you can't answer questions about your data. So be prepared to answer questions, be prepared to address any concerns before you actually go into your presentation. And I know now you must think that I just told you to keep things simple and now I'm talking about all this transparency stuff that means that you need to put in more information, so how do you choose? And I think the balance lies in disclosing enough information to honestly represent your findings and then having enough support materials to support your points where people might want more information or have questions. So by doing that, I think you're going to be just fine and you're not, you know, doing anything that might be perceived unethical. And before we get to the bonus point, and we are going to get there, I want to talk about knowing when to fold. And what this means is that sometimes you need to let the data influence you. Sometimes it says that your idea maybe wasn't as good as you thought it would be, it might not have as much of an impact as you were hoping it to have, and sometimes you just need to admit to yourself that maybe this was not worth presenting after all, and just admit and say that. Because there is literally no point in trying to manufacture or doctor the numbers or shift the metrics to make it look like your idea has more of an impact than it actually has, no matter how much you raved about it. And I've done the raving in the past, not the number doctoring, but we all know how it feels when we're very excited about an idea and then it turns out that maybe it doesn't work quite as we were hoping it to. And that is a very important skill, is to look at the data and in an unbiased way be able 
able to say when your idea doesn't actually make sense because it's not the last idea that you're going to have and it's definitely not worth sacrificing your credibility to because your credibility is much more important than one idea. You are going to come up with a bunch more, you might even be able to find a new idea based on your old one but trying to lie your way into actually getting it implemented and then someone seeing that the impact wasn't what you promised it to be, it's, it's bad. And as the bonus tip, I want to talk about something that we don't usually necessarily think about as a bit of, you know, techies when it comes to data, is qualitative data and how you can use that to help you sell your point. I've been going on and on about, you know, metrics and KPIs and, and numbers, actually qualitative data can be a huge help in building that narrative and context around your findings because it makes it more human. And using that to further land your point and make sure that your audience understands the true impact on the people that are actually affected by this issue is actually really powerful. So think about things like, do you have a chance to interview people? Is there possibly already qualitative data that you could find and see if it actually matches your findings, such as user feedback channels or collective questionnaires? Any of these examples are things that you can use to strengthen your point beyond the numbers. A lot of the times the quality of data might already exist, we just overlooked it. And that's a huge mistake because qualitative data can add a lot of depth to your narrative and your arguments, so using it is a great way to influence your audience. That is it. Those were the points that I wanted to talk about um, in terms of what I've learned about using data to influence people and sell my ideas and land my points and communicate what I've been working on and how impactful the results are in the past three years. And I hope that this video was helpful. If it was, smash the like button, leave a comment down below, tell me of any other ways that you are using data to sell your ideas and influence people. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you would like to see content like this in the future. That is all from me. Until next time, cheers.